Good evening, everyone. I am honored to be here to listen to the voices that have come before me and to listen to the voices that will come after. I am here to share my story as a writer, but before that, I want to tell you the story of listening to fire. When we think of fire, what comes to mind may be the recent catastrophic wildfires in Hawaii, which claimed more than 100 lives and displaced more than 300 people. Or perhaps we are reminded of civil defense officers bundling young children to safety and charging through a blazing apartment. Or perhaps it is the sight of a certain place you pass by on the way to school or to work each day, silent and charred and black. But most of the time, fire stays in a wood stove or in the fireplace. It is a chemical process. It magically transforms fuel into light and into heat. And even in the single flame of a burning candle, it is there, quiet, barely audible. We sometimes forget that it is the sound of burning that we pay the most attention to, as opposed to the sound of fire. For the sound of fire to be heard, we ourselves have to set ourselves aside so that we can be silent enough to listen to this voice that is barely audible. And that is how it is with writing. It is how we set ourselves aside so that we embrace voices in this common space. It means that writing is a space of meeting and of hospitality. It forces us wordsmiths and word artists to think beyond our own stories. This is my question. When does my intentionality as a writer become a larger intention for writing itself? And dare I say, literature as an art form. When does the written word truly hold the stories of all those around us? I truly became a writer with my first book, Bang My Car. As some of you might know, it is a story about uncle in his sling singlish voice. The stories are written half in English and half in singlish. There are also stories about his children and grandchildren in a variety of forms, such as the university application essay, which I gather from an earlier speech has generated quite a bit of interest in the room. Bang My Car was published 10 years earlier. I was certainly writing before that. I wrote lots of poetry, and they call that juvenilia because it is juvenile. It's bad. I will just confess that <laughs> right up front. That is not to say I was not grateful for the opportunities I was given. I had many teachers who encouraged me to write. I went for creative writing camps. I submitted my work to competitions. I saw my work in print in journals. And it is really something to see those words on the page. But I wouldn't have considered myself a writer, at least not from today's perspective. To write is the activity itself. But to be a writer is to change your essential relationship to words. What changed with Bang My Car was that I wanted to write the voices of the people that I was listening to around me. Many of them spoke a variety of English that wouldn't be associated with literature, at least until 10 years ago. Yet something in the voices of my real life uncles, in the people that I was listening to in coffee shops, on trains and buses called out to me to give it life in written word. This is who I dedicated Bang My Car to. This book is dedicated to all who have no time to waste, who abhor literature in favor of life. Against the whole habit of a lifetime, I was writing for people who may never pick up a book. I was no longer simply writing. I was writing for and with people for whom the dignity of their existence ex exceeded the current forms that language could offer to them, at least literary language. I was listening to these voices, even if I was not fully understanding what they were saying. 
I was listening to fire. I was a writer. And this is what the fire had to say about uncle. I'll read this little excerpt from Uncle Noun, which is modeled after a dictionary entry. Uncle, a term used to denote an older man, usually between his late 30s and 90s, in a Singaporean context. Not a denotation bounded by social class or wealth. As a social type, a patriarch-like figure considered beyond the bounds of eligibility or attractiveness, whether married or unmarried, also generally considered beyond the boundaries of youth. As a social group, not usually considered a threat, commonly seen taking black coffee in glass cups stirred with metal spoons, he may also be seen consuming beer at a late hour, usually with a plate of no hyang. Rarely observe dining at McDonald's. Broadly speaking, however, the uncle is a type and wears his essential nature like a badge, whatever his job, status, or ethnicity. In local parlance, he wants face and is unlikely to give you face. Whether he is sitting in the MRT with his legs apart or in the lounge of the Shangri-La, unsmiling with his gold Rolex. Our advice to those unfamiliar with uncle is to avoid antagonizing him. But that wasn't enough. How could I put the voices of the uncles around me into printed words? How could I give them life in a way that simply wasn't about mocking their bad English or for just comedic effect or simply within dialogue? Was there a literature in Singlish? I found myself writing in uncle's voice. Here he is talking to his wife after an operation. Why do you keep asking me questions? Where I go every day? I tell you my knee is bad, my leg pain. You say I don't bother about my own body. Every day take camera, go out and jalan. I go out, you complain. Now I stay home, you complain. I don't care, so you must care. I don't do anything means you must do something. I talk so much so that you must keep quiet. Don't look at me some more, okay? I wrong so you must be right. Now you say don't shout bad for health. Hey, where are you going? I say you come back, huh? You know today I cannot walk, right? Then why you still do it? Why are you taking water for me? Don't put the cup there, sure drop down. Hey, I didn't ask for it, you know. If I don't drink, then it's your fault. I told you the cup will drop down. Walao eh, spoil the cup. Everything broken. Why you do stupid thing? Leave it, I'm telling you. Later I clear up. Stitches already out, what, three weeks already. Nowadays, my later is not tomorrow. My later is not tomorrow. All writing is a sense too late. When we put pen to paper, Life has already happened. And so this act is belated. Belated, but beloved. My writing is the trace of an encounter with another. And some days, as I go out and about my day, everything is on fire. Every person that I meet, every face, every gesture, every movement speaks to me in the form of a story. Not my story, but the living presences of those around me. It is at that moment I feel I might write a poem. I would create something that would convey that encounter. My second book was a collection of poems titled Burning Walls for Paper Spirits. It is the Hungry Ghost Man, which is what the title most clearly alludes to. It's a strange little collection. It contains a series of poems where we become friends with the things around us. And in a strange way, these things become alive to us. For example, there's a poem in the book about how an android wants to become a tree. There is also a poem about how we could listen to a guava. It's a version of Ovid's Metamorphosis, if I could claim that distant ancestor. In my collection, however, Walls are burned down between one person and another, between one state and the next. 
And in every poem, I am listening to fire. Or perhaps I should say, the poem is listening to fire. Because with true intentionality, the writer becomes one with her words. I'll read you this poem by way of closing. Becoming an HDB flat. Riding the lift up, I grow as tall as you and emerge 16 stories above our bricked-in horizon. My face is one of many flat roofs, dish-eyed with water tanks. Both of us exhale the sky, which at one o'clock is sweating white, and up our flanks shiver the sounds of school buses returning. Children slap their chalk shoes at my ankles, a minor streaks, that's my beauty more. I bristle with laundry and potted bandan. I smell my pits where mattresses are left to sun and wheeze humid TV static. There is bad guess from the ninth floor karaoke. Mostly I stand columned on stumps over a void, absent in the afternoon's slow wrinkling until someone hurls a bag of rubbish down my gullet, 15 stories of swallowed thung. The effluvia of rush hour footfalls is a rash in my corridors. I scratch and find blood in flats, all those rooms, lives impeccable for being thoughtlessly pulsating. Sometimes when many taps are running, I wake enough to count my fingers and feel for the windows in my skin. Peering through one, I find you, curled up, a thumbprint, in my bed. It has been five years, but it is always high noon and both of us ill on MC. Outside the curtains, the workers raise their gondolas to paint us a new face. They never look in. But our words look out and look into the burning, speaking presences of those around us. On good days, I can hear the fiery woes that press through my writing. But first of all, I must be still enough to be able to listen to what you're saying. In his 1992 Nobel lecture, Derek Walcott calls poetry the grace of effort. I hear it as the grace to hold myself aside in favor of a poem or a story that's yet to come. And I think at this point, it is time for me to be silent, to listen to the voices that come after. Thank you very much.